Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jennifer Walker, your instructor for the webinar. My contact information is up here. If anyone has follow-up questions or would like additional information, you're more than welcome to email me after the webinar. Um, just to give us a big picture overview of the HEC HMS timeline, uh, many of you are familiar that it started out as a HEC 1 model, DOS-based version. Um, within the last um, several years, GIS applications were developed to um, streamline some of the watershed processes and allow shapefiles to be brought into the program. Uh, the current version is version 4.0, and the big change with version 4.0 compared to the version 3 series is that water quality features, uh, reservoir sedimentation features um, were added uh, to the program. So for many of our projects that have water quality modeling components and maybe have a green infrastructure component, uh, I'll tend to use EPA SWIM or models like WindSlam or other water quality type um, specific models. Uh, but in some cases, um, HEC HMS can be a great tool for the water quality component, um, looking at sedimentation uh, and other uh, associated pollutants from the um, watershed itself. And then it's um, designed to pair up with HECRAS Unsteady Flow um, in terms of feeding uh, data into HECRAS Unsteady Flow for larger stream system uh, water quality modeling. So one of the projects that we're working on right now uh, involves um, construction of a coffer dam uh, and diversion of flows during the construction period. Uh, because it has a dam component and a water quality component to the modeling, in addition to hydrology, that makes HEC HMS um, a good tool uh, to consider for that particular uh, project. Uh, but we're going to focus more on the uh, hydrology aspects of the reservoir routing as opposed to the water quality aspects, but it's good to know uh, that those features are out there and available to be used. Um, so we'll cover several topics today um, within the uh, webinar outline. And as we go through, we'll walk through a couple of examples to give you a feel for how to actually apply the nuts and bolts and hands-on use of the HEC HMS. Uh, modeling uh, tool. Uh, so the model itself has quite a few different components, but if we focus on the reservoir or detention routing, which was is done in exactly the same way, whether it's a drinking supply reservoir or a stormwater detention facility or a combination. Um, so we basically have several different components that are required uh, within the model. Uh, all HEC HMS models need some sort of meteorologic model uh, control specifications uh, and a run manager, which just basically um, tells the model um, what scenarios are being uh, analyzed. Um, so this screenshot is from version 3.5. Version 4.0 looks very similar, uh, but we have a, a basin model um, on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, and then um, uh, detailed data entry on the left-hand side of the screen, and then any errors or notes or warnings uh, show up at the bottom of the screen. Um, so reservoir data um, can be fairly detailed. Uh, this also applies to detention basins, and we'll go into some of these items in more detail as we get further into an example. Uh, but things like what type of outfall structure, what are the tailwater conditions, if any, uh, what's the initial water surface elevation within the reservoir? Uh, what's the elevation area or elevation volume relationship for the reservoir? So very similar to other detention routing models, if you've used um, other programs, uh, it's just that HEC HMS um, also is a watershed-based model, so it has a, a lot more hydrology uh, options than some programs. Uh, so we can model dry detention basins. M maybe they have a, a recreational component uh, within them. Uh, we can model wet detention basins. Uh, one of the things to be careful with with a wet detention basin is setting the um, starting water surface elevation not at the very bottom of the basin, uh, but at the static water surface. Uh, there's also calibration options that can be used within the model itself or specific to a uh, reservoir uh, if you have gauge data. Uh, outfall structures um, can be modeled in several different ways. 
Um, the HEC HMS capabilities currently are, are much, much better than they were in early versions or back in the HEC 1 days. Um, so uh, the outflow structures is most similar to other um, detention routing programs where um, we can incorporate either a culvert, an outfall structure, orifice openings, um, spillways, and so forth. Uh, dam tops can also be used. Uh, the specified release and the outflow curve require you to know additional details uh, from um, some other um, type of analysis. Um, but in any case, um, there's great ability to um, use multiple outfall structures. Um, from this project, there's basically a trapezoidal weir uh, as a um, top uh, outfall and um, two um, uh, culvert openings at the bottom uh, for lower flows. Um, so our drainage area data uh, consists of the size of um, the surface area of the subwatershed, um, what type of loss method, things like green and amped, which is physically based. You might also be familiar with the SCS curve number method. It's a very commonly used loss method. And there are others in there uh, as well. The transform method is what type of unit hydrograph uh, method is being used. In this case, the Clark unit hydrograph method. Uh, the SCS is used very commonly. There's the Snyder method. Uh, HEC HMS also allows for kinematic wave routing. If you have highly urbanized um, drainage sheds, um, that's very commonly used also in uh, green infrastructure uh, modeling. But in any case, the um, subbasin data uh, is combined with the uh, meteorologic data or rainfall data um, to develop a rainfall hiatus graph, which is basically just the shape that the rainfall or the pattern of the rainfall uh, for this, and it's um, displayed in an upside down manner here. Um, but the um, peak center is at 67% um, for this particular design storm. And then that translates into a runoff hydrograph where we've got time on the x-axis and flow on the y-axis. Uh, the meteorologic model um, may use precipitation gauges. Uh, it may also use a frequency storm, uh, a design storm event such as the 100-year uh, the two-year, the 10-year, and so forth. It can be a 24-hour basis, um, which is standard in, in many parts of the country. Some parts of the country are more focused on um, shorter duration events like a three-hour or a six-hour, and there's also that ability um, to customize that. Uh, control specifications just basically tell the model when to start the analysis and when to end the analysis. Uh, but it is very important that these be set up correctly uh, if you're using paired data, which we'll get into in a little bit, um, things like a um, stage hydrograph uh, or other time series data, um, the, um, uh, the starting and stopping times need to be consistent uh, or um, the model may have issues with running. Uh, so that's a pretty common um, uh, issue that people run into. The run manager just basically creates a model run uh, with a set of rainfall data and a um, basin model uh, condition. So multiple um, items to input uh, for the model. Um, we'll go through each one. Uh, the reservoir data. Okay, so again, this is an example um, that we'll walk through. Uh, but here we have a um, regional uh, detention basin. It's um, circled there. Let's see. Um, and there's also an inflow hydrograph into the detention basin. Uh, it's basically the area draining into the basin. There may be additional offsite area. Um, and so that's a drainage subarea that contri contributes directly to the detention basin. We have a diversion um, structure which diverts flows out of the stream into the basin, uh, and then the basin uh, actually drains out through the same structure uh, back into uh, the watershed. Uh, but in this case, it's um, simulated uh, with a uh, outflow uh, node. So we've got that set up. Uh, the next blue line is just simply a routing reach, uh, which simulates uh, the stream downstream of the basin. 
and then a, an analysis junction or node downstream of that. So our data includes, in this case, uh, we're using outflow structures, uh, elevation area, uh, could also use elevation volume, and we have to tell the model uh, basically um, where to find the elevation area data. We don't um, enter it right here. HEC HMS is set up um, such that various parts of the model have to be able to communicate or um, talk with each other, uh, if you will. So um, the, the reservoir data needs to know to go look in this other part of the model to pull in the elevation air area or uh, elevation volume. Uh, initial condition can be based on flow. In this case, it's based on elevation. And we're um, starting the uh, water surface at the uh, bottom of the basin. Uh, tailwater uh, conditions, um, there's various that could be chosen. In this case, it's a stage uh, hydrograph. We have one outlet structure and one spillway. Uh, paired data uh, is in a different place in the model. Uh, but in this case, it's the elevation area function uh, that describes the storage within the basin. Uh, it's always nice to plot these up to make sure that um, it's a nice um, smooth line. Uh, but you can see that the storage increases uh, pretty substantially as the elevation in the basin increases. Uh, and then we have our outlet uh, structure data. Uh, in this case, we have a culvert. Uh, you could also have an orifice opening. Uh, and so it's very similar data to HECRAS, if you're familiar with the HECRAS model or the FHWA um, curves. So it's the type of pipe which relates to a chart number, uh, what the configuration of it is at the outlet, uh, which also relates to a scale number. I can choose a box culvert, a circular pipe, and there are other options. Uh, so typical data that you would use like for a Manning's equation calculation, the length, the diameter, uh, and then we also need the inlet or the flow line. Uh, what is the entrance and exit coefficient, 0.5 and 1.0 being fairly common. Outlet locate, outlet elevation, and then also your Manning's roughness coefficient. Um, the spillway is basically, um, in this case, used to simulate a weir. Um, and um, it can be used uh, for an OG spillway or for a broad crested spillway, which would be more typical of, say, a trapezoidal or a rectangular weir. Uh, the coefficient can vary um, from standard tables based on the type of weir that's planned. Um, but we incorporate in elevation data and also length data. Now, in this case of the model, the um, spillway um, is used to represent um, flows into the basin and flows out of the basin. Um, so the, the basin is diverting flows out of the stream, but then it's returning flows to the stream later on. So it's a regional um, detention or flood control facility as opposed to just a facility or feature uh, serving a single um, development or subdivision. Uh, so there's not enough flow entering the basin um, to make it work effectively uh, from a flood control perspective unless it diverts flows out of the stream. All right, so a different method, the specified release method. Uh, you could in incorporate a discharge gauge as time series data. Uh, this isn't part of our example model, but it is a different method um, that can be used. Uh, same thing with outflow curves. Again, this data goes in the time series data. Um, storage discharge, elevation discharge. Uh, these, this type of feature was used a lot more commonly uh, in the HEC-1 model, but it's still here and available. It's also used quite a bit for uh, reach routing in methods like the modified pulse that are accounting for significant storage uh, within uh, a wide and flat floodplain. Uh, but again, this is in here for reference, but not related to the example project. All right, so dam tops uh, are also an option that can be included in the model. HEC HMS does have dam modeling uh, capabilities. Uh, similar to um, the spillway, uh, they're, they're, they use very similar uh, data. 
Uh, if it's a non-level top, um, station elevation pairs can be incorporated. Uh, pumps can also be used within the dam and reservoir uh, model. Um, if there's uh, more release than just the dam top, uh, then we have to use the outflow structures uh, as well, very similarly uh, to just a specific reservoir analysis. Okay, we also have the capability to model dam breaks uh, within the uh, HEC HMS model. Uh, each model can have one dam break. So what that means is if you need to model multiple scenarios of dam breaks, um, then uh, various additional models need to be um, created. Um, so we can have failure by overtopping. Uh, that's typical with certain types of dams. Uh, in this case, the expanding breach uh, ends up being represented by weir flow. Um, we can simulate uh, failures by several different methods. Um, one being if the elevation um, stays, if the water surface stays at a certain height or higher for a spe specified duration, that can tr trigger a break. Uh, Maybe just that if it hits a specific elevation, that would trigger a break. Or you can hard code in there at time 24 in the design storm event or in the modeling analysis, um, you'll have a um, specific um, dam break occur. So there's um, various options in there. Um, there's also a progression method that can be used. Uh, piping break can be simulated as well. This would be um, piping uh, inside the dam. And this occurs usually with uh, earthen dams. Um, similar input to overtopping, uh, but just a different method of failure. Um, dam seepage can be incorporated. Um, we have to use the outflow structures method for this. In each dam um, seepage, um, only one outflow or outfall is allowed. Okay, so getting into tailwater options, um, depending on um, the specifics of the project inlet versus outlet control, tailwater can be uh, one of the more critical factors in terms of how does the reservoir, how does the detention basin function. So inlet control um, basically means that the out, outflow um, amounts through the um, structure are governed by the elevation within the basin. Outlet control means that the tailwater is um, high enough that it's interacting and it's um, affecting um, the discharge through the pipe. Um, if the tailwater elevation is higher than the elevation in the basin, um, then we won't see any uh, discharge occur. And if there's not a flap gate or something preventing backflow, we'll actually see backflow occur into uh, the reservoir or detention basin. And this can be very useful if we're trying to also provide floodplain storage in addition um, to detention storage. Um, so our example is going to include a stage hydrograph, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, some of these other methods. Uh, but let's go to a poll question. When would you use free discharge for the outfall? Uh, so if we can get each site to weigh in. Okay, it looks like most sites are voting for inlet control. Uh, and also we've got a couple sites um, weighing in on areas with significant topography. Um, generally, so inlet control is correct, but if we're in an area of significant topography where uh, the detention basin is um, quite a bit higher than the receiving stream, uh, that will also tend to um, be a condition where we would use free discharge. Um, so, so both of those are good answers. Let's go back to our slides. Uh, 
Okay, so if we have free discharge, basically we just click the assume none under the stage um, uh, method. Uh, fixed tailwater is another option. Um, this is used very commonly in storm drain design. It might be the top of the outfall pipe in a certain design storm event. It may be a certain elevation in the receiving uh, channel or receiving stream. Um, so this can be very simple to use um, in many cases, and if it is a free discharge um, condition, uh, then fixed tail water is not a bad option, although we've got the ability to just simply choose free discharge. Uh, the limitations of fixed tail wa water are that it's very often not realistic. Um, sometimes uh, we might assume a high value. Uh, in that case, the outfall structure is going to tend to be larger uh, than needed and the peak flow rates or discharge may be higher uh, than what is really allowed uh, or desired. On the other hand, if we assume a low uh, tailwater condition, the outfall structure may be undersized, which will force the volume in the basin uh, higher than desired. So if you're trying to provide free board uh, within the basin or um, keep the uh, flows contained within the basin for a specific design storm event, um, we may end up with an inadequate volume. Okay, so for fixed tailwater, we simply use fixed stage and incorporate in the elevation. Uh, the stage hydrograph is um, part of this example problem, and it's the most realistic uh, in terms of real life uh, simulation. It's typically best uh, assumption for large watersheds. Uh, it's also a good assumption for smaller projects or smaller watersheds. Uh, that have outlet control um, and um, uh, potential backwater uh, into the basin. All right, so the stage hydrograph correlates with design storm events, it's, and it's important that it's developed for the same design storm event that's being used uh, for the detention or reservoir uh, routing. Uh, so it's incorporated into time series data as a stage gauge. And this can get a little bit tricky, um, not in terms of incorporating the data, uh, but these um, dates need to match uh, and be consistent with what's in the control specifications. Um, otherwise, it can create a, an error um, trying to run the model. Okay, so stage hydrographs are developed using rating curves, which typically come from a hydraulic model like HECRAS. Uh, they may also um, be obtained from data within the flood insurance study or FIS. But a rating curve is simply what's the water surface elevation at any given flow within the stream. Uh, and then um, from the rating curve and from a runoff hydrograph in the stream, uh, we're able to generate a stage hydrograph. Uh, so the stage hydrograph is basically time versus stage, and that represents um, the water surface elevation in the receiving stream. Okay, let's go to another poll question. What does the stage hydrograph tell us about the receiving stream? And it's the one we just, um, just looked at. So if you have your handouts there, Okay, it looks like we've got um, one response for a 24-hour design storm event, a couple responses on that. Um, so those of you who voted for that, that's, that's a great vote, um, and that is absolutely correct. Um, let's go back and look at the stage hydrograph, uh, because there's another thing besides that it can tell us. So basically we have, here's our... 24, uh, it's listed as zero, but hour 24, and the, the um, stage is starting uh, starting to drop out. So it's, it's already 
um, risen and it's starting to fall. Um, so that gives us a good idea that this might be a 24 hour design storm event. Now we do see that the watershed is fairly quickly um, filling uh, the levels in the stream, but what's interesting to know is it's not draining out very quickly. Um, this is a, a pretty slow response. So by day two, by day three, uh, the receiving stream still has very high water surface elevations. This tends to indicate either it's a large watershed or it's a watershed that's not very developed, uh, that has a natural floodplain, that's slow to respond hydrologically, and maybe there's a lot of storage in, in the overbanks. So if we study um, the stage hydrographs, the runoff hydrographs, uh, they're very instructive and they can really tell us a lot uh, about the watershed um, that we're working in. Okay, so there's, there's other methods in, in terms of the um, tailwater conditions. Uh, this downstream of main discharge um, tends to be used um, where you've got a pump station and interior ponding. Uh, so it's a very specific uh, situation. Reservoir main discharge is for specific reservoirs um, that span the entire stream channel um, but are not influenced by backwater. Uh, so very large scale dams. Um, this would be a great point if anyone has any questions to go ahead and send those in uh, by chat. Uh, in the meantime, I'll answer a, a few um, frequently asked questions. Uh, so sometimes people wonder, how do you model interconnected detention basins in HEC HMS? Well, HEC HMS is, is not necessarily the best tool for modeling interconnected detention basins. Uh, there are other models um, like uh, interconnected channel and pond routing, pond pack, HECRAS on steady flow, uh, which is also free software, does a great job with interconnected detention basins. Um, for HEC HMS, I generally would not model an interconnected detention basin unless they were generally at the same elevation and had a large connector culvert without a lot of um, losses. If they're at different and varying elevations, um, that would lead me to use a different model um, like HECRAS on steady flow or one of the other specific detention models. Another question, uh, what are some of the common errors in HEC HMS? Well, I've mentioned a couple of them. One is that the control specifications time uh, needs to be entered carefully and any paired data or time series data, um, if you're getting errors with the running the model, uh, you want to check and make sure um, that, that that time frame matches the control specifications. Uh, we also sometimes see in importing older models um, to into version 3.5 into version 4.0, which have um, tree canopy um, and, and a few other items. Um, as you import the older models in, it's going to put a default value in there. So you want to go in and choose uh, no uh, or no, none on the uh, tree canopy method. Um, that's typically used for continuous simulation modeling. Uh, and not um, specifically on design storms. Um, um, one final um, issue that sometimes people run into is that the meteorologic data, um, we won't go into this in detail, but within the meteorologic model, um, you have to specifically tell HEC HMS that this meteorologic event uh, needs to be paired up to a specific basin model. So for example, if you have existing conditions and you want to run a 10-year, um, six-hour analysis, you have to tell the meteorologic model that that 10-year, six-hour um, storm applies to the existing conditions model. Okay, moving on. Um, there are various types of detention facilities. Um, HEC HMS um, does a good job of modeling uh, most of these, again, interconnected uh, ponds, for the most part, I would go to a different model. Um, but let's look at um, the various types. So off-stream is, is for detention is, is one of the more common where um, an area being developed drains directly into a detention basin that then discharges into a storm drain system or into a stream. On-stream detention um, typically has a diversion uh, from the adjacent stream. 
depending on where you are in the country and stream mitigation requirements um, with the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, this may or may not be um, an option. Uh, also, you know, giving, given other ecological concerns. Um, inline detention, uh, typically a little bit less efficient. Uh, it can be simulated within HEC-HMS. Uh, we're not going to focus on this today. Uh, you would generally do that within uh, the routing reach or within a um, reservoir um, simulating the routing reach. Um, but usually for inline detention, I would tend to go to a HECRAS uh, unsteady flow model over HEC-HMS. Okay, so basically the on-stream basin is basically diverting flows out of the stream. It may also have an adjacent area draining into the basin, uh, but a key feature is that it's diverting flows from the stream into the basin. And this um, methodology we're going through applies to, to really any type, type of detention facility. Here we have a, um, a nice um, native grass uh, within a detention basin in Lenexa, Kansas, uh, which has a program called Rain to Recreation, uh, where they fund many of their flood control and stormwater uh, programs uh, by in combining an, a recreational element. Um, so uh, native grasses are pretty amazing. Um, they're a great uh, way to reduce uh, maintenance, improve water quality, and they can also significantly improve infiltration. Uh, there's been some uh, column studies that show uh, the roots of native grasses can penetrate you know, up to 27 feet. Now that's within a uh, laboratory, uh, but in the natural world, um, they, can, they can go pretty deep. Um, there have been some recent studies that have shown uh, pretty significant infiltration increases uh, with native grasses as compared to, say, the um, adjacent and surrounding turf grass. Okay, so continuing on with our uh, example, um, this was a uh, regional um, detention uh, basin. It's using a side weir um, or a spillway to divert flows out of the receiving stream. Uh, the watershed's fairly undeveloped. It's really intended uh, to reduce flood risks downstream. Um, from this sketch, um, the model's a little bit complicated, the watershed model. There is um, a diversion and a natural channel, uh, but the detention basin is located uh, in this stretch here. All right, so we've got flows being diverted out of the stream. Uh, so there's a specific little diversion feature into the basin, inflow hydrograph from um, some drainage area into the basin. And then the same side weir spillway structure uh, allows flows into and out of the basin. It's just that with HEC HMS, we have to assign the outflow uh, to a different location. And so at this point, um, the outflow or discharge from the basin combines with the flows in the stream um, and then is routed downstream to the next node. Okay, so our diversion is simulated as a lateral weir. And what's important here is that the elevation, length, and coefficient data is going to exactly match the spillway data because it's the same structure. Uh, we just have to model it in two different ways. Um, the exact same as the spillway data in the detention basin. Um, so the lateral structure um, requires a channel rating curve. Uh, this is simply ob obtained from um, the HECRAS model. And again, it's just uh, elevation versus flows. Uh, and this can uh, be accomplished by using a HECRAS uh, steady flow model and running through multiple profiles. Usually, it could be the design storm events or, or the FEMA uh, FIS events, or sometimes we run 10%, 20%, 30%, and so forth of the 100-year event. Um, so the HECRAS results, uh, in this case it was percentages of the 100-year, but basically it's our flow versus our water surface elevation. So the spillway from the reservoir has the exact same data as the lateral structure. Um, and we can look at the hydrographs. So 
we have flow diverted into the basin is the lower hydrograph. The middle hydrograph is the flow that wasn't diverted. It's continuing downstream. Um, before the diversion is the upper hydrograph. Um, so visually, uh, you can analyze it and see that it makes sense. All of the flow is accounted for. Um, this is the receiving uh, stream in this case. Uh, the inflow hydrograph into the basin. Uh, looks like it's a 24-hour design storm event. It's peaking at about 16 hours or 16% or 67% or so through the uh, storm. Okay, so what we really want to know is, does the basin work? Is it providing some flood control? Are, are the benefits there? Um, so there's a lot going on in this graph. Uh, the yellow line is the stage in the basin. So it fills up and starts to very slowly drain out. Um, what this tells me is that the stage in the stream is also pretty, probably pretty high. Well, it matches what I know about the stream, which is that it's pretty undeveloped. It's got a very wide floodplain. On the lower graph, the tailwater sta stage is also in yellow, and that is indeed the case, that um, it stays high for, for quite a while. So the storage in the basin fills up as shown in green and starts to drain out and moving um, back to the lower graph. So the inflow into the basin is the um, dashed line and by combined inflow this is basically the diversion into the basin as well as the inflow hydrograph from area um, discharging right into the basin directly. Now the outflow hydrograph there's no out, outfall or outflow that occurs until about hour oh, 15 or so, maybe on um, day two. And then all of a sudden we have um, outfall occur um, pretty substantially. So what this means is up until um, the point that the discharge occurs, the tailwater is higher than the level um, within the basin. Okay, so let's go to a poll question. What do the spiky lines in the graphs represent? Uh, so here you can see some spiky lines. Um, basically, we've got you know, the outflow from the basin showing up. The flow not diverted, that's the flow that stayed in the stream and didn't get diverted into the basin. And those get combined to show the combined outflow in the stream. So what does everybody think? What are the spiky lines? What do those represent? Okay, well, it looks like we've got some very smart attendees. Um, all of the sites are saying either model instabilities or fluctuation back and forth over the weir. And both of those are correct. Um, so one way to address uh, and, and lessen those spikes is to change the time step on the model. So if we have it at a 15 minute time step, we may need to go to five minutes or even two minutes or a minute or 30 seconds um, so that the model does more computations um, and smooths out uh, those spikes. Um, but because the water surface in the stream is very similar to the water surface in the basin at this point, uh, there may be some fluctuation uh, back and forth over the weir. Okay, so moving on, we want to look at the downstream node. This is right where the detention basin discharges back into the stream. So there is some additional um, drainage area contributing to the stream at that location, as shown by the lower hydrograph. Um, the combined outflow in stream is basically the um, detention discharge plus what was coming um, from uh, upstream. And then the combined downstream node adds in the additional drainage area. Now, if we want to look at, are the, does, this, does this work? Is the basin functioning well? Uh, what do you all think? 
Does the regional detention facility work? Okay, it's, it looks like it's an even split. Um, nope, 60% yes, 40% no. So let's take a look. Okay, so our outflow from the regional basin uh, occurs at, again, about hour 16 or so, maybe on day two. So that is, if we look at this graph, hour 16 or so on day two means that it's occurring about at the time of the second peak in the stream. Well, that's good. If it was occurring at the time of the first peak in the stream, it would tend to be increasing peak flows um, downstream, which we don't want. We want them reduced. Um, now, we may need to look at specific numbers in terms of what the existing and, and what the proposed peak flows are. How much did this first um, uh, spike or peak in the hydrograph come down compared to existing conditions? Well, it should have come down pretty substantially uh, because we had flow that was diverted into the basin. Backing up here. We had over a thousand CFS um, diverted or a thousand cubic feet per second diverted into the um, basin. So based on looking at the hydrographs, we would really expect that the regional detention facility is providing flood control benefit. Now again, we'd wanna compare the peak flows and see what the actual value is. We might even want to change the peak flows in the HECRAS model uh, and find out how much the water surface elevation is being reduced. Um, so that brings us to model output. Uh, we can simply look at a global summary table um, at all of the elements um, within the model. Uh, tabular results uh, in a time series at the regional basin. That can be useful to export into um, Excel or other programs for graphing. Um, some people like to use DSS view um, and uh, graph up results and customize results within DSS view. It's just a data, data management system. Um, but let's go through a fixed tailwater example. Um, so this one's more simple than the previous one. Uh, we basically have a single drainage area draining into a detention basin uh, with just one outfall pipe, no weirs, no spillways, uh, fixed stage hydrograph, and our basin is starting out at an initial elevation of 544 feet. Um, so we still need the elevation storage or elevation volume data incorporated into paired data. We need an outlet structure. Uh, it could be an orifice, it could be a culvert. In this case, we're going to use an, uh, an orifice. Now, um, one thing that can sometimes cause issues on the orifice outlets is make sure you use the surface area uh, as opposed to um, the diameter uh, of the opening. And it's a center line elevation, not a flow line. Okay, so we can look at our results, um, same as the um, previous project, but again, a little simpler. So we have our inflow hydrograph, we have a routed outflow hydrograph, and we can see in the upper graph, yellow um, elevation uh, within the basin and a green um, storage within the basin. So um, drains out much more quickly um, than the previous larger scale uh, flood control um, detention basin. All right, so what do you do if you have some odd errors or loss of data? Uh, Heck HMS is so much better than it used to be that this doesn't happen uh, that often. Um, but sometimes closing the model and reopening it um, can help um, if it's not reading um, specifically a stage hydrograph. It's also helpful to save the model as you go. But again, most of, most of these issues now that we're at version 4.0 have really been um, taken care of. If you used Heck HMS in a very, very early release, uh, you may have run into um, some major issues, but those bugs have uh, been worked out of the program. 
Okay, so how do you optimize the outfall structures? Um, in this example, we want to determine if the site is effective for regional detention. We're going to analyze the hydrographs to help decide what to change. And we want to track the changes or the performance. Otherwise, in many of these projects, you get into 10, 15, 20, 25, or even more uh, iterations of the modeling. It becomes difficult to remember back to what's been tried or what hasn't been tried. And so basically we repeat the process. Um, uh, so in this case, we're just looking at a, a very basic dry bottom uh, regional detention basin. Um, here's the general location uh, and some undeveloped land. You can see a couple of streams going through it. We're going to um, just analyze it as a very um, basic basin um, with a side weir. Um, we're not going to break it into multiple basins. We just want to see if we had a conceptual basin in this location and we diverted flows out of the stream, you know, is it going to be adequate for regional detention? So we have a very small watershed. Um, we've got a, a drainage area. Uh, we've got a diversion into the detention basin, which then drains back into the stream. Um, so in this case, the lateral structure on the diversion needs to match the spillway uh, out of the basin. Same structure. Okay, so in this case, we've gone through about seven uh, various uh, modeling iterations or run scenarios. And you can see we don't need to analyze a 100, 200, 300, 400, 458 foot weir. Um, we're just looking broadly at if we make some changes to weir widths or elevations, what does that do for us in terms of our results? So by the time we get to a thousand foot wide weir, and this doesn't have to be concrete, it can be earthen, at elevation of 290, we're seeing uh, 14 and 15 percent decrease in peak flows in the stream. So, you know, depending on the goal, that could be um, adequate or substantial reduction. Uh, it just depends on what the um, project goal is. In this case, you know, given the size of the stream, it ended up being uh, pretty reasonable um, to be able to proceed forward with incorporating it into a stormwater plan. So we're working on a um, similar project um, currently that um, started out, um, we did planning in HEC HMS and had side weir diversions, um, but unfortunately got to the point where peak flow increases were occurring actually upstream of the detention basin. Uh, and that's because there was so much area proposed to be developed and mitigated by a downstream detention basin uh, that it wasn't um, accounting for what was happening in the stream. Now there are ways we can do that within HEC HMS with storage routing, um, but we elected to move to HEC RAS Unsteady Flow, um, which has a lot more capabilities with dynamic uh, routing and hydraulic routing through the stream to be a little more accurate uh, with characterizing water surface elevations. Uh, but HEC HMS is great for planning level regional detention or um, any type of detention facility um, where we're not concerned with um, stream routing itself um, needing to be done hydraulically. Okay, so here's the example we were looking at. Um, basically we have uh, a diverted flow is the um, uh, small dashed line. So that flow was diverted into the basin. Uh, the basin is discharging um, the solid blue line, the middle line, and the combined flow, um, 